it's hard, you know, sitting out there and, and watching that. It's, you know, I know a lot of missionaries may say that, but to us, a lot of those people, especially the ones in Botswana that you saw, we raised most of those kids. Uh, my wife and I were told we weren't going to be able to have kids. That changed. You can look at our prayer card and figure that out. But, uh, but we were told we weren't going to be able to have kids. And so we put everything we had into those schools. There were boarding schools. Uh, most of the kids that we worked with, their parents didn't even know sign language. They didn't communicate with their kids. We, we saw especially Sinello's class grow up into their teen years. We were able to be there through those crucial times and just explain to them all the different things in life that your parents probably would have sat down with you and talked to you about. And so our heart is, is, is really, really in and around these people that we work with. Um, I'm going to answer one, one big question before I get started. Uh, the, the number one question I'm usually asked is, is how many languages do you speak? Well, I'm going to answer that. I speak, I speak four. I speak Botswana and sign language. I'm, I know English. You couldn't tell that by listening to me speak, but I do know English. Um, I, list, I, I know uh, Setswana, which is the language spoken in Botswana. And I can interpret South Georgia redneck for you too, if you need it. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, my wife actually is, is the linguist in our family. She speaks four different languages. Uh, she knows about six or seven different forms of sign language and uh, just amazing to watch her work wherever she goes. She can almost hear any language in the world and sign. If she sits down with a deaf person for more than five or 10 minutes, she'll be signing to them and be able to explain to them you know, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing to watch her work. Um, and I, I do two things in my ministry. I sit back and watch God work and I sit back and watch her work and then I try to get involved however I can. <laughs> but, uh, but no, the Lord is, is really great. Uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, we have a very important passage of Scripture. We're, we're going to see uh, kind of a question raised here a little bit. But tonight, and, and this was not planned at all, I didn't even know what video the pastor was going to be showing, but the title of my message tonight is The Value of a Soul. My father passed away about a year ago, and I was looking through, he was a pastor for about 35 years, and then he was the uh, president of our mission board uh, for the remainder of his time here on earth. And he was in the ministry over 50, over 50 years in the ministry. And I was looking through his notes, and I, I found a lot of unfinished messages, but the one that spoke to me the most was this one. It was unfinished, you could tell he just jotted down three points and left it at that. And the Lord used that to kind of bring this into my heart. He's used it ever since. And, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the value of a soul. Everyone on this planet, I don't care what they say they believe in, I don't care what they look like, I don't care what they can do, what they can't do, every human being on this planet has value. But that value can only be seen by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, and starting in verse 24, it says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples. Anytime we see that in the Bible where it says, Then said Jesus, it's a good idea to pay attention. This is the creator of heaven and earth. This is the one who knows everything about us, even things that we don't want anybody to know about, he knows about it. It's important to pay attention to what Jesus has to say. And it said, And then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me and let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, nothing in this life worth doing is free. Everything we do in this life requires sacrifice. Everything that matters. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's the question that stands out to me in this passage of Scripture. What is this life worth if at the end of it we lost the only thing in us that's eternal? Your soul is eternal. It's going to spend eternity in one of two places. We all like to talk about heaven. Nobody much anymore likes to talk about hell, but it's a reality. 
We will spend our life, our eternity, in one of two places. We'll spend it in heaven, we'll spend it in hell. And that is true for everybody on this planet. What we did here on earth is not going to matter much in eternity. When faced with one of two places. And Jesus asked, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Our God and our Father, I thank you tonight, dear God. I thank you for everything you do for us, with us, and through us, dear God. I thank you for this church. I thank you, God, for uh, them allowing a missionary to come and, and share his heart with them. I pray, dear God, that tonight you'll just put me to the side. You'll take over, dear Lord, and let your word come out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You see, man is not a body that has a soul, but rather a soul that lives within a body. I thank God every day this flesh is temporary. <laughs> you know, I, we, Pastor and I were talking on the way back from supper tonight, and I was telling him when I was in 10th grade, I had already gotten a scholarship to play for UGA. My, my 10th grade school year after football season, I got into horseback riding. I fell off a horse and I broke my back. Scholarship was over. But God has used that to lead me to where I am today. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in this world because I got to meet people like you saw in that video. I got to watch God do something only he can do and that is take the most vile among us and turn them into something that is honoring to his glory. It's amazing when you get a front row seat and that's all missionaries have. You know, we're all missionaries. You guys are missionaries here. It doesn't do me any good to go across this world and tell people about Jesus Christ if y'all weren't doing it right here. And all foreign missionaries are, or they're just people who get a front row seat to watch God work. <laughs> I, I got to the mission field and realized how much I really didn't matter in this thing. <laughs> you know, I, I never preached a, a, a decent sermon in my life, you know, and I got to the mission field and all of a sudden everybody's looking at me to preach. Number one, I didn't know their spoken language and I didn't know sign language and everybody's like, well, why don't you preach? And I'm just like, you know, the interpreter, which was my wife, could barely understand my language, South Georgia redneck. And uh, so, you know, it, it was just kind of funny and I'm just like, how is this going to work? And then God's like, it's going to work because I'm here. But when we look at it and we look at this, we, we start to see in here what the Lord is asking about is, is what is the value of your soul? What is the value of a soul found in his word? What is the value of a soul in the eyes of God? You see, we, we are not a, a body that has a soul. We are a soul that occupies a body, just like the family is not its house, but the people that reside in it. The same is, is with our body and our soul. But when we look at the value of something, the first thing we have to look at is its price. I got a 2011 town and country minivan. My wife will tell you that is going to be the hardest thing for me to give up and go back to Africa this time. I love that van. I don't know why. It just has it, been my most favorite car. It, it's, so, it's so universal. I can do about anything I want to with it, and I think it's worth a million dollars. Now, who in here wants to give me a million dollars for my town and country minivan? Price isn't determined by how much I think something is worth. Price is determined by how much you're going to pay for it. Price is determined, uh, the price of something is determined by the value someone else puts on it. When we look at mankind, we have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and we have to look into the book of Genesis, and we have to see what value God placed. You see, when we look at the creation account, God starts out, you know, and he, he's creating the light, he's creating the sun, the moon, and the stars, he's, he's dividing the water from dry land, he's planting grass, he's putting animals on it, and he did all that for one thing. The one thing that he was leading up to with the whole act of creation. You see, the Bible says that God spoke everything into existence, but there was one thing that the Bible says that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. How do you form something? You got to get your hands dirty. God put his hands into that dirt, and he created his masterpiece. 
his artwork. And he formed man out of the dust of the ground. Then it says that out of everything in creation, God breathed his breath into that man. The breath of life. You see, God created everything in this world for man. Nothing had value until he formed man out of the dust of the ground. That had value to God. It was worth all six days of creation just to see that man get up and walk with the breath of life that God breathed into him. We all know the story. That man betrayed his God. He sinned against God. At that point, most of us would be like, oh, well, that, he's got no more value anymore. He took everything I had and he just gave it away. All for a bite of one fruit. He traded everything in existence for that. So I'm done. But that's not what God did. God then put a secondary value on man. Every drop of blood that his precious son had. That is the value that God has placed upon us. You see, when we look at the value of something, it's all determined by point of view. I remember there was a kid in Botswana, and, and pastors probably seen this too in, in Zambia, but they would take Coke cans, and they would take those Coke cans, and they would actually build their toys out of those Coke cans. They would build these cars, and they actually had a wheel that they could turn with an axle and everything. It was amazing to see them build these things. And so one day I was just like, I would love to have one of those and put it out on my mission table so people could see it. And so I, I went down to that kid, and I said, how much do you want for that car? He looked at me, he said, a thousand pula. That was over a hundred dollars at that time. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not giving you a thousand pula, but he wouldn't part with it. That's how much he valued that car that he built with his own hands. I respect that. We would look at a Coke can, we don't see much value. We usually just throw them in the trash or throw them in the recycling or whatever we do with them, and we just throw it away. We don't think that has any value. But yet with those kids, while we were building that church, they would come every day and they would clean us out of Coke cans. To them, that was all the value in the world because they could build something that they could enjoy. I think about our school in the Philippines. Carol Woodley, who is our missionary there, uh, came to our church one time and she was asking, she said, we, we, I need potato chip bags. I was like, can you take potato chips to the Philippines? She said, I don't want the potato chips, I want the bags. And I thought that was funny. I mean, she was paying over 100 bucks just to ship a box full of potato chip bags to the Philippines. Then she showed me what they do with them. The kids in her school, you see, all of our deaf schools, the one in Ethiopia, the one in the Philippines, and, and our two in, in Zambia, we don't just teach them uh, book education. We also teach them a trade. We teach them how to do crafts or we teach them how to do something so that when they graduate school, they got something to do, something that they can make money with. And, and so we teach them a trade and her kids learn how to take those potato chip bags and make women's pocketbooks out of them. And they would sell them on the street and they would pay for their schools and pay for the shipping of more bags so they could do it again. It's amazing the value of something we might consider has no value, but in the hands of the right person has all the value in the world. That is our soul. We may think that individual over there has no value. The homeless man on the street, or the deaf person, or, or the mentally challenged person. You want to know the, <laughs> there is, we all have Bibles. I hope we all have Bibles. If you don't, you know, I'll buy one for you myself if you need it. But how many of us really take our Bibles for granted? I'll be honest with you. I, I'm a preacher, and your pastor can tell you too. Sometimes we just take it for granted. I know myself, I, I have a ton of Bibles. I just get, had to pack them up and store them so that they wouldn't get messed up. But there was a little girl that grew up in our King's Kids program, and she was about five years old. And so what we would do is, is when they turned about 10 or 11, they would work that year for their Bible. They had a, a whole checklist of things they had to do. They had to memorize. It was over 100 verses. They had to do a lot of Christian services because we wanted them, when they got that Bible, we wanted them to value it. We wanted them to take care of it. It was something they earned. And so this little girl at five years old kept bugging me. I want a Bible. I want a Bible. And so finally I told her, you know, 
basically just to get her to be quiet. And I was like, well, if you do everything that those kids do, you can have a Bible. That little girl learned 100 verses. She did 10 Christian services. She earned her Bible. The day I handed it to her, broke my heart, I handed her that Bible. The first thing she did was she put it up to her lips and she kissed it. She couldn't read a word in it. <laughs> and that's how much she valued that Bible. She still has it. I ran into her last time I was in Botswana. She's a, an adult now, but she still has that Bible. She came running out of her house and showed me, well, Ruthie, I've got the Bible. She still values that Bible. But there's nothing more valuable in this world than a soul. First Peter 1, 18 through 21 says this, for as much as ye know, ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the most perfect human being to ever walk this planet, who was not only man, he was also God in flesh, gave every ounce of his blood for you and me. That's the value God put on our soul. Take the focus off of that for a minute. Put yourself in God the Father's place. I love y'all. I love everybody I encounter. I love people in general. I like to sit around and talk to people all the time. I annoy people in the mall. My wife won't even go with me anymore. But, but I annoy people to that degree. I just, I like to me. I want to hear their story. I want to hear what they're about. And, and, and as much as I love people, I will not give up Logan Dykes for any one of you. That's my son. But God the Father sat in heaven for over nine hours and watched them beat his son. Watched him lay him down upon a piece of wood and nail him to a cross. Heard him cry out, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And sat in heaven that whole day and watched his son suffer and die for us. That's the value of your soul. That's the value of everybody's soul on this planet. So we see the value that God placed upon it in its price. The next thing we see is the value is in its preciousness. You see, when something's precious, it's something that is greatly loved and cherished. It's something that means everything to us. Consider this. Consider how precious a soul is if both God and the devil want it. I read that on somewhere and, and I, it just never left my brain. But if you think about it, your soul is valuable enough for them to fight over it. The devil wants you to go with him and God wants you not to go with him. <laughs> But think about how precious your soul is if both the God and the devil wants it. Psalms 116 verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Psalms 49, 6 through 8 says, They that trust in their wealth and boast in themselves and the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. No matter what you consider precious on this earth, it can't save you. Jesus Christ is the only precious redeemer for your soul. It's the only thing in this world that can save you. It's not about our success. It's about Jesus' triumph. There was a story about a, a young man who spent his summer making a little model sailboat. And he, he spent his money on the parts for it. He built it. He carved some of the wood out on it. I mean, this thing meant the world to him. He took that sailboat and he put it in, into the river. And he watched that sailboat float. Then it started going faster and faster and he lost it. That thing was precious to him and he lost it. You see, you and I, we were precious to God. He lost us. Later, that boy was walking down the road and he saw in a pawn shop, he saw his boat. He went inside that pawn shop. He asked the man, he said, how much you want for that boat? He said, that thing, he said, I found it somewhere. He said, you, you can have it if you want it. He said, give me, give me a dollar. You know, you're, you're not going to walk out of anything free in a pawn shop. But he said, you know, give me a dollar. And so the boy bought that sailboat, the boat that he built, and he got a tear in his eye. And the guy asked him, and he said, what means, why does this mean so much to you? He said, I built it and I bought it. It's twice mine. God built us, 
Then he bought us with the precious blood of his only begotten son. We are twice his. It's awesome. The next thing we see when we look at, at the value of a soul is we look at its potential. I don't have much time. I'm, I got time for one. I, I got two or three stories I like to tell here because there's, there's so much I can tell you. But we, we, we look at the soul's potential. There's a little boy that grew up in our youth department in Botswana. He had a, some strange form of palsy. They never did really figure out what was exactly wrong with him. He could walk, but he, he had to have crutches. His feet were like this. His hands were like this. He couldn't even sign. He, he learned sign language, you know, through doing different methods. The deaf actually developed a, a other form of sign language with this kid so they could talk to him and understand him. And it was just really unique to watch these kids. I mean, he grew up in that school, in that boarding school, so they all grew up together, and they developed a, his own kind of sign language so they could tell what he was saying what he was doing he understood fluently sign language he could read lips the kid was intelligent but he was born with this type of palsy his mother told me that when he was about five years old that she was cleaning the kitchen he wasn't deaf at that time it's it's rare for somebody to be born deaf genetic deafness is 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 very rare Um, but his, his mother said she was cleaning the house at about five years old, and, and when they clean the floors there, they use hot wax. And she wasn't paying attention, and she dumped almost an entire bucket of hot wax on this kid. His face, his body was scarred. Not only did he have the palsy, it also scarred him, and it was because of that wax that he became deaf. Now, you look at this kid, you don't see a whole lot of potential in him. What in the world, I mean, what in the world could he do here in America, much less in a third world country? What what is his potential? This kid got one thing that I know of in his life, is he got Jesus Christ. He was waiting for the day he went to high school. Because you see, when they were in elementary school, we would have to go to them. They wouldn't let them walk to the church. But when they got into high school, they got to walk to the church. Every Sunday, on his crutches, he would walk to church. We would stop the car and say, get in, you know, we'll take you. You, No, no. I've been waiting for this. I'm walking to church with my friends. It was over two miles to the church from that high school. And he would walk to church every Sunday. You've never seen a bigger smile on anyone's face. I love preaching because that dude would smile. You know, sometimes you preach and nobody in there smiling. and you're like, what did I say? You know, I'm not, I'm not that good. But, but this kid was always, I mean, he was the biggest cheerleader I had. He, I mean, it was awesome. When he was in the 11th grade, he died. And so he was the heartbeat of our church. I mean, there, there was no choice. We were driving to his funeral. We, we, got, uh, we rented a combi. We were going to go to, that's a mini, like a van they drive over there. And so we rented this van, and we were all going to go to the village to his funeral. It was about five hours away. We got to that house, and that's the first time I met his mother. His mother and the the Catholic priest were there, and they walked up to Corella and I, and and she couldn't even speak English, so Corella was interpreting. She said, I don't know anything about my son. The priest said, I don't know anything about him either. He said, would you do the funeral? I said, absolutely, because I I know everything you need to know about him. Corella and I preached that funeral, and about 72 people got saved that day. All because of this little boy that nobody saw potential in, but God said he's got all the potential he needs. He's got my son. Biblical illustration of somebody's potential is, is look at Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, a little man, tax collector, thief, whatever you want to call him. I mean, nobody liked him. I mean, he was just a nasty individual. Everyone in that village looked at Zacchaeus. He's got nothing going for him. But when Jesus walked into that village, he looked up in that tree. He said, I'm going with you today. You see, Jesus can bring the potential. It's amazing what God can do. The last thing I want to see, for sake of time, is we saw its price, we saw its preciousness, we saw its potential, but I want to talk to you, and I want to take this time right now to talk to you about the soul's peril. Your soul is a fragile thing. 
you can break your soul with one choice. And that choice is to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 28 says, and, and, fear, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Luke 12, 15 through 20 says, But God saith unto him, Thou fool this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Revelation 20, 14 through 15, an account that one of Jesus' apostles saw with his own eyes, said, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We do not like to talk about hell anymore. I don't like to talk about hell. That's not what Jesus was all about. Jesus was about freedom from that place. But I'm going to tell you something. We need to talk about it. Because there are people in this world in danger of going there. That's the only reason I'm leaving this country and going to another country. Yeah, it's awesome to be able to work in schools. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I got the best job in the world. God is going to let me play with kids and pay me for it. It's, it's awesome. But the reason I'm going to that country is, is because 50% of that country are Ethiopian Orthodox. In their religion, they cannot get saved out of their religion. 48% of that country is Islamic. We just watched a video about that. They cannot get saved in their religion. We're going over there because their soul is in peril. That's the only reason for missions. That's the only reason for you to cross the street and tell somebody about Jesus Christ is because their soul is in peril. We don't like to talk about hell, but there is good news about hell. There's great news about hell. Nobody has to go. Hell was a place prepared for the devil and his angels. When it came to man, God said, I'm going to make a way of escape. Jesus Christ died for you tonight. He died so that your soul does not have to be in peril. I'm going to turn it back over to the pastor in a minute. I'm here, yes, as a missionary. I'm here because I need support. I'm here because I need to get to Ethiopia. But the number one reason I'm here tonight is because I believe there's somebody in this house tonight that needs to accept Jesus Christ. Their soul is in peril. You are one choice away from heaven and you are one choice away from hell but remember the good news about hell you don't have to go pastor